But I'm going to be shifting focus a little bit in the sense of not only talking about the 20th century, but I'm going to be talking to a large extent, not totally, about foreign policy. Okay? But I'm going to start, there's an obvious place you have to start. In early 1941, Time Life publisher Henry Luce proclaimed in a famous editorial that this was to be, quote, the American century. That as, and these are Luce's words, the most powerful and most vital nation in the world. Americans had to assume a role of world leadership in every area. Let me give you Luce's words again. America as the dynamic center for ever widening spheres of enterprise. America as the training center of the skillful servants of mankind. America as the good Samaritan, really believing again that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And America as the powerhouse of the ideals of freedom and justice. Out of these elements, surely, can be fashioned a vision of the 20th century to which we can and will devote ourselves in joy and gladness and vigor and enthusiasm. And in many ways, this 20th century was the American century. And it was a very optimistic one at that. At least, not, obviously not for all Americans, but for many. What was this optimism based? Um, it was based not only on the extraordinary realities of American power in the 20th century, but also, at least in my opinion, and I'm going to float this as a thesis here, on the false belief that these powers were unlimited, that there was no end to them, nothing that could not be done. And when reality intruded and pointed out the limits of power, Americans would often respond by searching for scapegoats and conspiracy theories in order to escape their failures rather than accept limits. And the result would be, on the one hand, some of the most optimistic, and on the other hand, some of the most pessimistic times in US history. It is interesting in this regard that this feeling of we can do anything and everything parallels or is preceded by the enormous growth of American industrial power. The United States was not the first nation to go through the Industrial Revolution, but once it started, by 1894, the United States was the most was the wealthiest nation in the world in terms of industrial power. And by industrial power, coal, iron, steel, okay? By 1914, US iron, coal, and steel production was greater than that of all the powers of Europe put together. In the words of British historian A.J.P. Taylor, the United States by 1914 was not a rival nation, it was a rival continent. And coincidentally, I don't know, make of it what you will, World, 1914 is also the year that World War I starts. And by 1917, the United States has entered World War I. Now this breaks with an American tradition of avoiding European wars, misnamed isolationism. The United States never was isolationist, but it did wish to avoid European wars at all costs. And now you are in a, such a war. For what purpose? President Woodrow Wilson says it is to make the world safe for democracy. This is to be the war to end all wars. In his 14-point speech and other speeches, he sketches out a new world in which you will have the American vision of a democratic, capitalist, and peaceful society will spread over the whole world. I love the comment of French leader Georges Clemenceau when he read the 14 points. Moses had 10, and we broke them. Wilson has 14. We shall see. We shall see. Now, of course, you're not going to be able to do this. 
But not only are you not going to be able to do this, but it is in World War I that an alternative vision for the future emerges in Russia. The Bolshevik Revolution takes place during World War I. And in effect, both Lenin and Wilson are saying, we have the right way. We are going to remake the entire world in our image. And as the last speaker pointed out, what you will get here are the Pomerades and the first great Red Scare of 1919-1920. Now, Wilson failed. And he, obviously, he failed. But I would argue that the optimism of the American people continued at least in regard to economics throughout the 1920s. The 20s is a decade of economic growth and I believe that that growth has no limit. Let me quote to you now presidential candidate Herbert Hoover in 1928, quote, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. The poorhouse is vanishing from among us. We have not yet reached the goal, but given a chance to go forward with the policies of the last eight years, we shall soon, with the help of God, be inside of the day when poverty will be banished from this nation. Oh, did those words come back to haunt him. The optimism was, of course, destroyed by the stock market crash and Great Depression, 1929 forward. That is the worst depression in US history, and it appears to be the end of American optimism. Hard times, okay? What restores American faith and American optimism? Of course, the answer is Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, which will revolutionize the role of the national government as a whole in people's lives, and the role of the presidency in particular. Yet, the fact that very few people know, the New Deal did not really end the Great Depression. World War II ended the Great Depression. And deficit, heavy deficit spending was not a permanent feature of the New Deal. It became a permanent feature because it worked during World War II. That's another story. Um, but let me just, uh, if this is the case, how and why is Roosevelt able to restore such op optimism? And what I'd like to do is for at least a few minutes, focus on Franklin Roosevelt, what he faces. He faces a financial crisis, an immediate financial crisis, and a long-term e economic crisis. On March 4th, 1933, the day he is, he becomes president, the Great Depression had brought the economic and financial life of the country to a virtual standstill. 25% of the workforce is unemployed. The New York Times stock index, which had fallen from its high of 452 to 224 by the end of 1929, was now down to 58. U.S. Steel in 1928 had had 250,000 employees. That had gone down to 18,000 employees, and by March of 1933, it had no full-time employees. The U.S. gross domestic product was at half the level it had been at in 1929. One-third of all U.S. banks had already failed. And in February, the remainder began to fail. By the day Roosevelt is sworn in as president, 38 of 48 state governors had responded by closing all the banks in their states so as to prevent a continued run on the banks. I'm assuming most of you know, when you put money into the bank, the bank doesn't just let it sit there. It invests that money. And what will bring the bank down is if it does not keep enough cash reserves on hand, if you come in and say, I'd like my money back. Well, when this takes place, everybody wants his or her money back. The banks can't do it, and the banks are failing at an unprecedented rate. On the day Roosevelt is sworn in, symbolically, the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade closed. Okay, 
Now, cyclical depressions were nothing new in U.S. history. And in the past, the government had done nothing, let the market correct itself. But nothing had ever occurred as bad as this. And contrary to popular belief, it is not true that Herbert Hoover did nothing. He did quite a great deal. For numerous reasons, which I won't go into here, his policies failed. But I will quote you the New Dealer Rexford Tugwell, who later stated that most New Deal policies were, quote, extrapolated from programs that Hoover started. Yet, in typical American political fashion, Roosevelt and the Democrats will scapegoat Hoover and the Republican Party in the 1932 election as the cause of the economic collapse. And in a sense, they were. I'm not going to go into detail now, but their policies clearly led to what happened. Now, on the day Roosevelt becomes president, his first and most important goal is to end the financial crisis. The entire financial structure of the country is on the verge of total collapse. Uh, you can, if you wish, compare it to what happened in 2008. Uh, as I look at it, I think this was worse. Or maybe it looks worse only because what happened in 2008, the government stepped in to stop it from spreading even further. Um, well, what does Roosevelt do? Famous inaugural address. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, as one person has put it, the address as a whole stunned a numbed nation and gave it what one Roosevelt biographer labeled, quote, a huge shot of adrenaline. Um, I love the description. One of my colleagues and friends, when I team taught here in the intro course, said, trying to explain to the students, he said, it was as if you had been busted the night before and your father had come to bail you out of jail, is, is, is what it uh, felt like. But saying there was nothing to fear was utter nonsense. Starvation is something to fear, I would argue. There's plenty to fear. But what mattered on March 4th was not the content, but the tone. And the tone hits a public nerve. The White House is flooded with mail, unprecedented volume. 450,000 letters arrive in the first week alone. It slows down a little bit, but give you a, a, a statistic. The White House ma mailroom staff before this had consisted of one. During Roosevelt's tenure, it would jump to 70 people. The day after the inauguration, which is a Sunday, Roosevelt uses a World War I era law to shut all the banks in the country that are still open in order to prevent even more runs and a total financial collapse. But what does he label this? A bank holiday. We're all going on, the banks are having a holiday, okay? He also stops all gold transactions. He calls Congress into special session to begin on March 9th, and he then disappears with his staff to draft legislation to present to Congress. On March 8th, he holds his first press conference. And uh, Roosevelt press conferences, there, there are photos and there are transcripts. It's something to behold. It's banter back and forth. Uh, and Roosevelt, of course, in a wheelchair, just invites the press into his office. And they're standing, they're sitting, they're on his table. Uh, and, and it's just fly, flying back and forth. When Congress convenes on the next day, it is presented with an emergency banking bill which, by the way, had largely been written by bankers, uh, that would provide for government inspection and assistance to reopen the banks. That bill passed the House of Representatives unread in 38 minutes. It received Senate approval and presidential signature within eight hours. Roosevelt then, contrary to popular belief, there's no deficit spending yet. He presents a bill to cut federal spending in order to balance the budget by cutting veterans' benefits and federal salaries. But he also proposes a bill to allow the sale and taxing of beer and wine. Now that the Prohibition Amendment has been repealed, if we're going to suffer, we might as well be able to drink while we are suffering. <laughs> 
On March 12th, Roosevelt gives the first of his famous fireside chats over the radio. Roosevelt was the master of this new medium, the radio. And, you know, sit back, my friends, let me talk to you about banking, okay? And the image is Roosevelt sitting at home by his fireplace, talking to the American people. 60 million Americans tuned in. That's out of a population at that point, if I remember correctly, of under 100 million, uh, maybe 120 million. And what he says is, the banking system is now sound. The banks will reopen the following day, March 13th. Well, when they open, there are lines of people again. But they're not there to withdraw their funds, but to de redeposit their funds in to the banks. The immediate financial crisis is over. Now, what you see here are psychological tools that a president has. He really hasn't done anything major, but that stopped the immediate crisis. Uh, and there are other presidents who use these psychological tools as well. Now, obviously, this doesn't end the Great Depression. It simply means the financial structure of the country is not going to collapse. I'm not going to go through all the New Deal measures. That would, again, keep us here until evening. Um, but you can put them under what we call the three R's, three aims, relief, recovery, reform, temporary relief from those out of work and suffering from the Great Depression until full recovery occurs. And it will be the government who will aid in that process. Economic recovery in both agriculture and industry and reform of both the economic and the financial system so that a collapse like this can never happen again. To do all of this, Roosevelt, over the next few weeks, will propose 15 major bills, all of which Congress passes in six weeks. This is part of the famous 100 days. Much more will follow, especially in the so-called Second New Deal of 1935-1935. 36, but I'm going to jump to the end result, which is a new system. I think David Kennedy, the historian in his book Freedom from Fear, put it best. Roosevelt and the New Deal establish a safety net that makes capitalism relatively safe and thus acceptable to the bulk of the American people. You have to remember that by the 1930s, Capitalism and democracy had lost their appeal, and people were turning to communism or to fascism, more to fascism than to communism, or so it seemed at the time. But it is under the New Deal you get the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, to regulate stock, the Social Security Act, um, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp Corporation, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the WPA to employ the unemployed at government ex expense temporarily until the economy recovers, the Civilian Conservation Corps to take unemployed youth in the cities and put them up on the long trail, for example, re reforesting, replanting, and creating much of what is up there. Those of you who hike the long trail, who do you think built those shelters? Who do you think built those trails? By 1936, the economy was approaching its 1929 levels. But many of the gains are then wiped out by the recession of 1937, 1938, when Roosevelt, thinking the crisis was over, cut federal deficit spending. Roosevelt did not believe in deficit spending as a long-term solution. He believed in it as a short-term solution, and when he cut that deficit spending, the bottom fell out again. The economy would fully recover only with the restoration of government spending and the outbreak of World War II. Okay, let's turn to that war. While the U.S. response to the Great Depression was the New Deal, for the rest of the world, the response would be a turn to militaristic, authoritarian, and fascist governments and the rejection of the entire Wilsonian image of a world in the American democratic capitalist image. And the result would, by 1939, be World War II. The public desired to stay out of this war 
because it believed it had been duped into entering World War I. It was not the war to end all wars. It did not make the world safe for democracy. And you have all sorts of merchants of death thesis, that it was uh, armaments makers and bankers who manipulated the United States into, into war. It was British propaganda that got the United States in, into war. Oh, to quote a rock group from the 60s and 70s, the attitude was, we won't get fooled again. How many of you know that was the who? All right. Um, that changes in the spring of 1940 when everyone expected you'd have a repeat of World War I. Bloody trench warfare that would last for years. Let them kill each other. We'll just sit back. But instead, in a matter of weeks, Nazi Germany will conquer Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and then France itself, and it's about to invade England. There is great shock because this calls into question a key assumption behind American optimism, that our ocean moats in the Atlantic and the Pacific, and even in the Gulf of Mexico, can continue to save us from involvement in other people's wars and maintain the security that we have. We can be left alone simply to prosper. But now you've got Germany with a highly hostile ideology and enormous military power on the Atlantic Ocean and about to conquer England. That led to a revolution in American thinking about what constituted proper security for this nation and a decision with the passage of the Lend-Lease Bill in March of 1941 to provide war material free of charge to first England, then to the Soviet Union when Germany attacked the Soviet Union, and to China, which was fighting the Japanese, and anyone else fighting Germany or its Italian and Japanese allies, the Axis powers. Now, that decision to supply Lend-Lease aid will in turn lead to an undeclared naval war with German submarines in the Atlantic. At the same time, the United States applies economic sanctions against the Japanese to stop their continued conquest of China, and that in turn leads the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in depth now. I'd be happy to do so during the question and answer period. Essentially, um, the Japanese decide we are totally reliant on American oil, steel, everything to make war in China. Um, the Americans are cutting all of this off, so we are going to go for economic self-sufficiency in Southeast Asia, where you can get oil, uh, uh, rubber, tin, whatever you need uh, to make war. Uh, and the only force that can stop us is that American fleet at Pearl Harbor. Now, the Japanese success at Pearl Harbor and in the first six months of 1942, where the Japanese just run amok in the Western Pacific and in Southeast Asia, uh, this comes as a shock to the American people. And there would be numerous boards of inquiry trying to fix blame. And you get the rise of conspiracy theories to explain it. The most famous, the back door to war thesis. The New Deal had failed. Roosevelt wanted a war. He tried to get it by giving aid to England. The Germans would not oblige with a declaration of war, so he turned to the back door against Japan the Japanese allies of the Germans uh, in order to get this whole thing going. Uh, this conspiracy theory keeps coming up. Every decade, there is a new book claiming it. In my opinion, it has utterly no validity. It is a classic case of not understanding how people were viewing things at the time and assumes that they had the knowledge that we have now. And again, if you wish, I will be happy to go into that during question and answer. Despite the conspiracy theories, Pearl Harbor really didn't destroy optimism in this country. There was little question to the public but that the United States and its, its allies would win. But where the optimism began to crack was what sort of post-war world 
is going to take place. There's tremendous fear of a return to the Great Depression. The country is out of the Depression because of war orders. What's going to happen once the war ends? But on the other side, you get loose and the American century. We can remake the world in the American image. Now, that image has been dramatically altered by Roosevelt and the New Deal and by wartime deficit spending and the awesome military power that that spending created. By 1945, the United States has the greatest Navy the world has ever seen. It has the greatest Air Force in the world. It has the second largest army. But most of all, the incredible wartime production. The United States is supplying um, uh, the 16, approximately 16 million uh, men and women in uniform, plus the British, plus the Soviets, plus the Chinese. Um, the one that I look to, and I say this sums it all up, um, will or run in Michigan, uh, a huge factory devoted to wartime production, in particular B-24 Liberator four-engine bombers. By 1944, one of them is rolling off the assembly line every 62 minutes. And then, of course, comes the atomic bomb in August of 1945. Um, the widespread fears of a return to the Great Depression after the war continue to exist throughout the conflict, but they proved groundless. And I think it's largely because the whole world is wrecked except the United States. The United States was responsible for over 50% of production globally by 1945, and it also had all this military power. It also has economic and financial power, the Bretton Woods agreements, which are based on the dollar for the post-war world. Winston Churchill, as usual, summed it up in one of his quotes. In 1945, the United States stand at this moment at the summit of the world. And you get the beginnings of what will be the great American post-war economic boom. That boom does not spread to Europe. Europe does not recover. Europe is devastated. And conflict erupts with the former wartime Soviet ally, a communist dictatorship already in control of all of Eastern Europe as a result of the victories of the Red Army against the Germans during World War II. The great administration fear by early 1947 is that the rest of Europe Western and Central Europe is going to go communist, either by communist coups, as take place in Czechoslovakia in 1948, or simply by people voting communist parties into power locally. The Communist Party and its associates are the largest party in uh, France and in Italy in 1947. Um, how are we going to stop this? And the, the, the brilliant decision, I think, is we're not going to use our military power. This is not a military problem. This is a problem of restoring confidence and, as Roosevelt did in 1933, we will restore confidence by telling the Europeans that we will economically aid them. And what you get is the Europe, this is the great US strength. It's economic power, okay? We will play to that strength. And we will, with the Marshall Plan, the European Recovery Program, offer to help the Europeans. If they can come up with an integrated plan for recovery, we will then negotiate with them and help them to fund it. British Foreign, Min uh, Foreign Secretary Bevan said this was like a life raft extended to a drowning man and you immediately have this upsurge in confidence in Western Europe. How much the Marshall Plan actually did for the Europeans is now open to question, but usually it is credited with at least jump-starting um, the great European post-war recovery. 
The Marshall Plan is proposed by a Secretary of State, the former Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, the organizer of victory, appointed by a Republican president, and an accidental one at that, Harry Truman, and a Republican Congress. The Congress went Republican in 1946. It is one of the greatest examples of successful bipartisanship in all of American history. But in 1949 50, there are three great shocks which really shake the optimism of the American people. The detonation of the first Soviet atomic bomb, which, according to the American experts, was either never going to happen or not going to happen for another 20 years. I should have put experts in quote marks. Um, uh, the true scientific experts knew that that was bunk and that the Soviets were going to get it a lot earlier. At the same time, spy cases break in both Britain and the United States, spies in the atomic bomb project. And in China, the Chinese Civil War, the communist Mao Zedong defeats the forces of Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists, and Mao quickly aligns with the Soviet Union, the Sino-Soviet Pact of 1950. Well, how and why can these defeats be happening to us in the midst of the American century? This cannot be. The result is a search for scapegoats. Instead of recognition of American limits, and if you will, human limits. Uh, and I, I, I think there's one comment by the critics that sums it up. The battle cry goes out, who lost China? Okay? That assumes you had China to begin with, which you did not. But the assumption was China's the American ward. It's been the American ward ever since the open door notes. We went to war with Japan in order to protect China. Uh, if you, you know, again, please ask me during the question and answer period, and I will go into that further. But the answer that you come up with, who lost China? We were betrayed by communist spies and communist sympathizers in the Roosevelt administration and in the Truman administration. And those charges go all the way up to the Secretary of State and the president, who was charged with being a communist. We are talking, of course, about McCarthyism and the second great Red Scare of the 1950s, followed by the great Republican victory in both houses, excuse me, yeah, both houses and in the presidency under Dwight Eisenhower. But as the last speaker pointed out, Eisenhower is not a conservative at least not in the mold that we would identify as a conservative. And he will halt the worst aspects of the McCarthyism of the early 1950s. There is disagreement over, you know, on the one hand, he is so afraid of McCarthy and his handlers are so afraid of McCarthy that when McCarthy accuses George Marshall of being a communist, Eisenhower who was um, Marshall's protege, uh, is livid. And he does defend Marshall in the far west. But then when he gets to Wisconsin with McCarthy on the stage, his defense of Marshall is eliminated from his speech. Whether he eliminated it or his press secretary eliminated it, there's controversy. But instead what you get, those who defend Eisenhower in this, Say, McCarthy falls in 1954 in the Army McCarthy hearings because of what Eisenhower does behind the scenes. There is a new book about this called Ike and McCarthy by uh, an author named Nichols, if any of you are interested in this. Um, I believe that Eisenhower, as a moderate, did try to end the worst aspects of the McCarthyism of the early 50s, but he accepted, in turn, large chunks 
of what I would label this Manichaean view of the world. Reinhold Niebuhr, in one of his books, will label it children of light versus the children of darkness. We are the children of light. That is what we spread. The enemy is personified as the other in this um, view of the world. Uh, the man who personifies this in his public statements is the Secretary of State, John Forster Dulles. As the world, the third world decolonizes, um, Dulles will say, you have to be with us or against us. There is no neutrality in this struggle, this holy war against communism. Uh, for most of the third world, I love the comment of one writer, for most of the third world, former colonial world, the struggle between the Soviet Union and the United States is the equivalent of a struggle between General Motors and Ford. Uh, it's not our concern. Um, and the Americans come up with all sorts of analogies to say, it is your concern. My favorite one, Russia, you are the lamb, the newly born lamb. Russia is the wolf. We are the shepherd. And I believe at one conference, the Indian delegate says, very interesting. That's a fascinating way to put it. It conveniently forgets what the shepherd does to the lamb after he has saved it from the wolf. In the 1960 election, there is no argument about this. Both candidates, Kennedy and Nixon, are going to go full blast with the Cold War. In fact, Kennedy is the hawk. Okay? Let me just quote to you. I think many of you are old enough to remember hearing this and watching it. Let me just quote to you from the inaugural address for a minute. Okay? Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans, born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a harsh and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Um, it's, it's a battle call, uh, quite clearly, and it will be centered on communist Cuba which had gone communist during the Eisenhower years. It's a new call to arms. The result of this, combined with Kennedy's inexperience in military affairs compared to Eisenhower's, will be the Bay of Pigs fiasco in 1961, and then the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, the Cuban Missile Crisis, once it ends, is portrayed as a great American victory. We came close, but Kennedy stood tough. We won. That's the way to go. We now know a lot more about it. First of all, secretly, Robert Kennedy traded US missiles in Turkey for removal of Soviet missiles from Cuba. That was the quid pro quo. And we came a lot closer to nuclear war than anyone realized at the time. In conferences held afterwards um, with the participants in the missile crisis, it became clear that the Soviet commander in Cuba had the power to order a nuclear strike on the United States if an invasion took place. Uh, when Robert McNamara heard that, he was still alive, he turned white. Uh, they did not realize that this was the case. Um, okay. Uh, 
Kennedy will be assassinated in November of 1963, and the, you want conspiracy theories. They run wild. Again, I'm not going to go into them. I'll be happy to discuss them and the problems I see in some of them, at least some of them, during the question and answer. I will quote, my wife once said, my husband does not believe in conspiracy theories. He thinks human beings are too stupid to pull them off. <laughs> it's true. But then you get the height of American optimism under Lyndon Johnson. Okay? Let's just go through a couple of the things that, the, that Lyndon Johnson is going to try to do simultaneously. A civil rights revolution for African Americans at home. A war on poverty and expansion of the New Deal to create a great society. Continued economic growth, prosperity, um, more safety net to include things like health care, Medicare and Medicaid. For those of you like me who are on Medicare, very thankful for that. Then again, it's, one can correctly claim it's our money to begin with. Uh, but at the same time, Americanization of the war in Vietnam. Why? Because the South Vietnamese are about to lose. It's as simple and as clear as that. And the war in Vietnam is perceived as part of the global Cold War, and you cannot allow a defeat here. To put it mildly, that was too much. It was guns and butter. And even with all our power in the mid-1960s, we could not do that. And the fault lines in the society begin to erupt massively in 1967 and 1968. The radical journalist Andrew Kopkind in Ramparts Magazine, um, writing in the summer of 1967 about, quote, the great American crack up, compared it to what had happened to the USS Forrestal, a huge aircraft carrier that almost sank not because of enemy attack, but because of internal malfunction, which starts a chain reaction, okay? It had to do with fuel on the deck, uh, and, and, it, and it just spread. It almost killed one of the naval aviators on board that air, aircraft carrier named John McCain. Came very close to killing him. Um, and what you get is this uh, 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 year of, um, what he referred to as the great American crack up. The civil rights laws and great society legislation proved grossly insufficient to deal with the racial, economic, and social prob problems taking place. You will get the rise of black power at this time. It also didn't deal with our gender problems at all. You get the rise of femini the second wave of feminism at this time. Uh, you get the beginnings of the economic financial crisis due to the overheating of the economy due to the war. You can't do guns and butter. And you get the rise of, in, in the universities of the new left and the counterculture and a total rejection of Johnson's version of the American dream, uh, similar to the rejection by African Americans who turn to black power. Ironically, though, I would say these are all part of the optimism of the 1960s. Johnson is saying we can do everything, and Johnson's attackers are saying, yes, we can do everything, but you're doing the wrong things. Uh, it is that same sense of no limits. No limits at all. Um, uh, what that, of course, ignores is the fact that there is a massive white conservative backlash building against all of this, symbolized by the rise of George Wallace and the Southern shift from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party with the elections of the mid-1960s. And then you have the year of the great American crack up, 1968, an event each month that shook the nation the Tet Offensive in January and February. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. Johnson's decision in March not to run for re-election. The assassination of Martin Luther King in April. The assassination of Robert Kennedy in June, 
The police riot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago with the youth yelling, the whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. Optimism has been, put it mildly, been severely shaken. And Americans will turn to Nixon and the Republicans in 1968 in an effort, in a hope, to calm things down and restore optimism, but things only get worse. Uh, Vietnam, no solution. Anti-war protests grow, and they will lead to Kent State. The decline of US economic and financial power will continue, not only because of the war, but because of the rest of the world finally recovers from World War II, and the United States becomes highly dependent, or the high dependence of the United States on outside resources grows and becomes visible, as illustrated by the 1973 oil embargo and the lines at gas stations that some of us here remember quite vividly. As if all of that's not enough, then comes Watergate uh, and um, the realization that the president had been lying through his teeth, obstructing justice, uh, and is an unindicted co-conspirator. His party will not back him once everything comes out. He is forced to resign from office, and a year later, the final defeat occurs in Vietnam. Bottom of the barrel, from the overextension, the overenthusiasm, if you will, of the 1960s. And all of that will lead in 1976 to the election of the outsider, Jimmy Carter, and a hope for a return to optimism. But under Carter, things continued to get worse economically, and you get with the revolution that overthrew the Shah in Iran in 1979, the beginnings of a global rejection of American ideology. You also get a heat up of the Cold War with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. I don't have a high opinion of Jimmy Carter, except for one thing. He did recognize the limits of American power, and he attempted to educate and get the public to accept those limits. Lower speed limits, for example, save on gasoline, shut off the lights, if you will, um, and that speech of his where he used Christopher Lash's essay, the culture, book actually, The Culture of Narcissism, to condemn the United States as a minister would for self-centeredness. American people did not like that. They didn't like what they saw, and they turned instead to a media-savvy former actor, Ronald Reagan, who promised them morning in America. Now, um, when Reagan was told he was the first president to be an actor, he didn't believe it. He said, how can anyone hold this position and not be an actor? Um, I think he was right uh, about that. Uh, I had no intention of going beyond 1980 with this. I'll just make one or two very brief comments and then th throw it open to you. With Reagan and Bush, you will get first an expanded empire, Manichaean again, the evil empire, then the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was not due to Ronald Reagan's policies. I'll deal with that in the Q&A if you wish to. And an end to the Cold War and the unipolar moment for the United States. No opposition, no competition for the future of the world. Obviously, a restoration of confidence and efforts to remake the world in the American image. Even a, a very interesting book on the end of history, meaning the end of ideological conflict. The American capitalist democratic image is what the world is going to be. And you get globalization, but again, that didn't happen. And that brings us up to the present and the total rejection of the US-led globalization and democracy and a sharp turn domestically and globally to secular and religious authoritarianism. Why that is the case, what the future holds for American optimism are subjects for another lecture that deals with the 21st century. So let me stop there, thank you. In the uh, recession of 1937, was it not also uh, due to the Federal Reserve raising interest rates prematurely?
And also, during uh, the uh, Vietnam War, you get the impression from Ken Burns' uh, series that both Kennedy and Johnson, uh, despite information that said that it was a losing battle in Vietnam, they did it so that they could get reelected, because it was an unelectable position to maintain that we need to pull out of South Vietnam. How many of you have seen the Ken Burns documentary first? Good. Um, it's, it's quite good. It's quite good. Since I teach this, I didn't really learn anything about the United States that I did not know before. But he put a good twist on it. I learned a hell of a lot about the North Vietnamese that I didn't know. Um, and uh, the Fed, yes, and that's not the first time the Fed made errors. The, the Fed is established under Woodrow Wilson, and it pursues policies that made in the 1920s that helped to precipitate the crash and then pursued exactly the wrong policies afterwards. Uh, you know, the Fed is not the hero in, in many cases. Um, uh, and in terms of the Burns view, yes, I, it came across loud and clear that neither that Kennedy nor Johnson nor Nixon thought they could win. What they had to avoid was as John McNaughton put it, the Deputy Secretary of Defense who tragically died uh, in 1967, why are we escalating this war? Why are we Americanizing it? 10% you know, stop the Chinese, 5% uh, this, 70% avoid a humiliating defeat. Now, not to defend these presidents, but realize they had lived through a history and they were terrified Republican and Democrat, by a possible return to, instead of who lost China, it would be who lost Vietnam. And another McCarthy era taking place within the United States and their belief that they had to avoid it, as is wont to, to, to happen with human beings who uh, run for high political office. They equated their own political uh, future with the future of the country. Uh, and you can rightly condemn them for that, but clearly that would have been the end of their political careers. And you would have had, you would not have had anti-war people coming in. You would have had people coming in going, nuke them, um, if they had not put the limits on, at least in my opinion. I think the Ken Burns film, the excellence of the Ken Burns film is shown by the fact that Left and right both dislike it and say it's too fair to the left or it's too fair to the right. And I think it hit the right middle ground in what it was doing. In your opinion, how would Roosevelt be rated today had uh, he only been a two-term president, had not been the leader of World War II, based on the New Deal? Would he be remembered today, in your opinion, as one of the great presidents? Not in the top three not with Washington and Lincoln. You put the Great Depression together with World War II, and clearly he's in that pantheon. I think he still would have gotten into the near great category uh, just for the New Deal. Uh, because the New Deal, for all its successes and all its failures, it changes the United States. It changes our way of life um, in terms of the establishment of this safety net and these security pro, pro, provisions, which, as has been pointed out, uh, opponents have been chipping away at ever since the New Deal. They have never given up. Uh, and and, and uh, we see that right to today. Okay? I understand that the Marshall Plan offered for the Soviet Union to be a beneficiary of it. Is that true? Say it again, that the Marshall Plan was offered to the Soviet Union. Yeah. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. One of Stalin's worst blunders in the Cold War was turning it down. Now, he had good reason to turn it down, but I'm, I'm going to be Machiavellian here, okay? Shock. Stalin had been offered it, and he was interested in it at first. 
He sent Molotov, his foreign minister, to attend the first planning session in Paris with the European nations. Are we going to accept this aid? What does it mean? He wanted bilateral aid from the United States. He had wanted that during World War II. There was talk of a loan of $6 billion to rebuild the Soviet Union during the uh, war. When he found out it would be multilateral, he decided to turn it down for two reasons. One, if it succeeded, it would pull the economies of his satellites in Eastern Europe away from him and towards Washington. Uh, the, the economic impact would affect his East European empire. Second reason was, if you are going to economically rebuild Europe and integrate the economies of Europe, please tell me what the kingpin is. Which country? Germany. Germany. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, that is Stalin's worst nightmare. The rebuilding of German economic power, which can then be turned into military power. But by walking out and doing everything he could to prevent the Marshall Plan, he gets the conservatives in Congress to vote for it, number one, which they never would have done if he had been part of it. And if he'd been part of it, he could have torpedoed it from the inside. He could have just got yet, yet, uh, and tied the whole thing up. Instead, he says no. And when it goes into effect, in order to make sure it will work in the three western zones of Germany, you move to create the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, and Stalin, to block that, blockades the western zones of Berlin, which lie totally within eastern Germany. And the aim here, stop the Americans from forming a separate West German government. It boomerangs terribly. The blockade is a failure. You have the Berlin airlift. You do come close to World War III. But the end result is that it speeds up the formation of a West German government. So one of those great what ifs. If what if Stalin had said, yeah, this is a good idea. I think I'll go along with it, is a third reason he said no. He would have to open up his economic records and just show just how devastated the Soviet Union was. Uh, one of my colleagues compared the Soviet economic situ situation throughout the Cold War to Popeye. Remember Popeye? Okay. Eat spinach and that forearm. Okay. That's the military. Everything else is this scrawny guy. There's just nothing there. Uh, and Stalin didn't want the West to see that. But the, the offer was made, most definitely. With all this um, economic power after World War II, how is it that we did not end up with universal health care as other countries did? <sighs> did you all hear it? Johnson pressed for it. Johnson pressed for it. You know, I'll go out way out on, on a limb. Um, without the problems in v Vietnam, which wreck his coalition, I think he could have gotten it in the 1960s. Try after try meets with failure, despite everyone saying, we're going to do it this time. We're going to be able to do it this time. Uh, and of course, it's only when we get to Obama. And the only way Obama can get it through is to accept the plan of the Republican governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney, who then denounces the plan once Obama says it is, it is his. But he thought by doing that, that he could get bipartisan support for it. Um, that didn't work. Uh, Roosevelt, too, his coalition, there were three things that happened in 1937-38 that wreck the Roosevelt coalition and portions of his own Democratic Party turn against him. He still has the majorities in Congress, but he cannot get the bills through. Um, the first is the, and, and perhaps you had the recession of 1937-38, um, but I think more important were two things. One, um, the attempt to pack the Supreme Court, which was just over the top. 
Uh, he was accused of being a dictator, a tyrant, trying to destroy the third uh, branch of government. He wanted to be able to appoint an extra Supreme Court justice for every one of them over the age of either 65 or 70 on the grounds that they were too old to be able to take the workload. Someone should tell Ruth Bader Ginsburg that. Um, uh, and that, a lot of his former supporters turned against him at that point. And the other was an attempt to purge the Southern Democratic Party of those who were opposed to New Deal measures, um, and that fell flat on its face. His popularity did not translate down to the local level. Uh, not the first or the last time we see that happening. Uh, and you put those three things together, his magic over Congress had been broken uh, by those three things, and he just, he, there were a few more bills that went through in 1938, but uh, um, he couldn't get the really big ones that he wanted. Uh, Johnson tried and failed, as I said, uh, again and again, uh, efforts. You know, one can also say, I'm, you make analogies, there are other things where you think it's going to go through, it's going to go through, and it doesn't. What about the Equal Rights Amendment? Everyone was saying, it's going to go through, it's going to go through, and then you get unexpected op opposition, as well as expected opposition. The one that I have studied, that I find fascinating, Marshall, just Army Chief of Staff in World War II and the most respected man in the country, called for an end to the draft and the establishment of universal military training. Not universal military service, universal military training. He used all his prestige and could never get that through. Opponents arose from places you didn't expect them. <laughs> the one that I love, and I've seen the documents, college presidents. It had nothing to do with politics. It had to do with, if, I, if those kids are not going to be going to college, what's going to happen to the budget of the university? Uh, but um, other groups opposed it. So there are many measures where you think it's going to pass, and it doesn't. I'm sure the Republicans were firmly convinced that they were going to overthrow Obamacare in uh, 2017. You made a point that I hadn't thought of before, and that was about the improvement of American morale or optimism during World War II. And I'm old enough to remember the tail end of the Depression and all of World War II, and you know you're right. Mm. And part of it, of course, was a very good propaganda machine because we never realized how close we came to losing that war. Correct, yeah, but, we did uh, come close to losing it. But I, I, I think it's an important point. Thank you very much, Neil. That's my former colleague and friend, Neil Stout. First of all, I was surprised to learn that Johnson wanted universal medical care. I don't remember that, having lived through the 60s. I remember Medicare, I remember all those things, but not the universal. And would, be, would the argument use, be used against it? Oh, that's socialized medicine? Yes. Wasn't that part of the conversation at the yep. time? Yep. Johnson, he felt Medicare and Medicaid was the most he could get. Remember, Johnson was the master of the Senate. And he figured, I can get this. Let's wait a bit and we'll go to the next step. And yeah, it would, the charge was socialized medicine. Uh, opposition from numerous groups, not least the American Medical Association, from that. Okay, I guess that is it. Thank you very much.